where I'm picking up, uh, we're going to pick up with specific heat. I'm still in this conversation on water <laughs> and characteristics of water. We've already talked about the differences between heat and temperature, units of measure for heat and temperature, and, and chemistry and physics behind heat and temperature. We're now moving on to this concept called specific heat. And you can see an example of specific heat here. And basically, the idea of specific heat is the amount of energy that different materials can store is going to be different. So the amount of heat that I have to add to gold to get it to increase by one degree centigrade is less than the amount of heat that I have to add to water. Once again, here with specific heat, we're using water as our standard of measure. So a specific heat is always going to be taken relative to water. So specific heat, the mathematical definition, if you will, is the ability of one gram of substance to be increased or decreased by one degree centigrade. So the amount of heat that we have to put in to increase or decrease that substance's temperature by one degree centigrade. And I said it's always relative to water, right? So water is going to be one calorie. I have to put in, remember, calories and joules are a measure for heat. If I put in one calorie to water, I move that water up or down, or if I remove one calorie, I move the water up or down by one degree centigrade. Okay? This is actually a relatively high specific heat. Another substance, the air that's around us right now, remember thinking back, uh, on, on water, Lake Lanier, you get out to Lake Lanier, air temperature might be 100 degrees, right? Lake Lanier may be right at 75. The air temperature of air has increased probably in a, in a day from the warming from 65 degrees up to 95 degrees. I'm typically summer day. Air has a specific heat of 0.24 calories. So that's less heat that has to go in air to move it up by one degree centigrade. So why does water have such a high specific heat? And it all goes back, well, does anyone have to know where it goes back? We sort of alluded to this last time. It goes back to the function of the hydrogen box that's present in water. So when we add heat to something like air, the heat goes directly to making those molecules of oxygen and hydrogen and the other gases to move. Okay? Whereas with water, when we add heat, I first have to use that energy to break the hydrogen bonds so that those water molecules now don't have that affixing force. And then more heat is added to increase the molecular movement of the water. And remember, it's the molecular movement, that version of molecular speed, that dictates the temperature of the substance. So because there are a high number of hydrogen bonds forming and reforming in water, when we initially add heat, it goes to break the hydrogen bonds. Not to speed up the molecules. Add a little more heat, we've broken the hydrogen bonds, now we can begin to increase the molecular speed. So we actually have basically two layers of things that we need to do. Break the hydrogen bond, which requires a certain amount of heat, and then start to move the molecules, which requires more heat. Whereas things like gold or air or other materials, the heat that gets put in immediately goes to increasing the speed of the molecules <coughs> to break the hydrogen bonds. So it's less energy that's required. So the concepts that we've talked about so far, um, within terms of the biological system, especially as we begin to look at the biosphere and Earth as a whole, we have a lot of large bodies of water on this planet. The oceans and the in the United States, the five Great Lakes, and other locations around the country and around the world have large bodies of water within their, within their borders as well. Those large bodies of bodies of water, because they have to break bonds, they 
have to increase molecules before they begin to increase temperature, they become very good at holding heat. We call them heat sinks. In those heat sinks, because there is so much water, those heat sinks allow great changes in temperature without massive um, changes in the temperature of the water. So a lot of the heat that changes, like when we have heat summertime and things like that, a lot of that heat coming in from the sun is trapped in the water rather than causing massive amounts of temperature change on my solar climate saying it stays very hollow across the whole across the whole world. If we didn't have the number of oceans and lakes and open bodies of water that we have, we wouldn't be able to stabilize our global temperature. And if we couldn't stabilize our global temperature, we'd be in a much more inhospitable environment. That can be a complex part of life in the world. Really all that can be used. You know, there's um, uh, organizations all over the world that are looking for extraterrestrial life. Really good use of government dollars, right? Um, but probably one of the biggest inhibitors to finding life on other planets is the fact that there's so little in the place, just small amounts of water. In fact, that's one of the first things that they'll go and look for is to do a survey to see what type of water is present in many. So that's why they got really, really excited when they found uh, some water on Mars. <laughs> they found water on Mars and like, oh, maybe it's possible for life to have actually existed on Mars. Now this idea of specific heat also plays into a characteristic known as heat of vaporization. And this is kind of crazy stuff that we're about to talk about here. But this idea of heat of vaporization is the idea of how much heat is required to create a vapor or a gas from a material. So water at room temperature, it's a liquid. If we add heat, eventually we begin to cause that water to boil. You know how we're familiar with that. And what's happening as it's boiling is that is the gas phase of the water escaping from the liquid phase. Okay? So the amount of heat that's required to go from liquid to gas is known as the heat of vaporization. Now, in terms of heat of vaporization, what's going on is you begin to add heat, and what happens? The molecules begin to increase molecular speed. And once they get fast enough, once we've increased molecular speed to a fast enough speed, actually we've added enough heat, those molecules will begin to escape as the gas or as the vapor. So we've added enough heat, and that liquid escapes to a gas or to a vapor. Now, in terms of water, we increase heat, break the hydrogen bonds, increase more heat, begin to increase the molecular speed. Temperature, remember, is the temperature of a substance, remember, is the average molecular speed in that substance. So if I have five or six molecules and they begin to increase their speed and the fastest molecule moves away, the remaining molecules, their average speed actually decreases because I'm taking away that really fast influence, right? So, to try to explain that, I'm going to put some math to it here, and this is this is a pretty important concept to uh, to really understand what we're about to what we're about to hit on. So, let's say that I have don't make fun of me for my cars, my drawings. Let's say we have cars, all right? Sweet sedans. I'm going to draw three of them in here. Three cars. And each of these cars, let's say this is traveling at 50 miles per hour, this car is traveling at 100 miles per hour, and this car is traveling at 25 miles an hour. Or maybe we'll make it 50, that will make the math on this car, let's do that. So two cars traveling at 50 miles an hour, one car traveling at 100 miles an hour. What is the average speed of those vehicles? 
And it's basically two hundred over three, which is roughly right around what's called seventy miles an hour in the average speed. Right? So average speed is seventy miles an hour. This is my fastest car, right? Now let's say that that fastest car is speeding at hundred miles an hour, and he just pulled over in the right place. So I'm left over now with losing the fastest car in that group of three cars. Now what's the average speed? 50 miles an hour. Okay. So what happened? As I lost my fastest car, my average speed went down. Okay, now let's put it in terms of water molecules. Let's say I have three water molecules. And let's say the average temperature here of this guy is right at 100 degrees centigrade, 50 degrees centigrade here, 50 degrees centigrade here. 100 degrees centigrade is my heat of vaporization. That's the heat that's required for that molecule of water to build in the liquid phase that the gas wins. So again, average temperature, 70 degrees centigrade roughly, right? Then as this goes from liquid to gas, what is now the average temperature of the liquid? Fifty degrees centigrade. I've just decreased my temperature, but I'm adding heat. This phenomenon where as you add heat and you lose the fastest moving molecules and you have a reduction in the average temperature of the liquid, this is known as evaporative cool. I'm causing the fastest molecules to evaporate off. The leftover molecules that are still in liquid phase, the average temperature is actually going to be dropped. Yeah, so once water starts to boil, as I'm losing those molecules that are turning into gas, I'm actually continually causing a decrease in temperature. Now, if I keep it on the burner, right, I'm still adding more heat in, so you kind of have those two opposing forces. And eventually, you're going to have water that, um, that begins to um, maintain the, an ever increasing temperature. But this phenomenon where we see the fastest molecules moving away, results in this reduction in temperature. What do you call it? The this is going to be called evaporative cooling. And this is just simply that idea that as we add more heat, the water is, the individual water molecules are all changing their molecular speed or their temperature at different rates. Okay, so some of the, if you look at a big pot of water, some of the molecules will be at 25 degrees, some of the molecules will be closer to 100 degrees, some will be at 50 degrees. And the temperature phenomenon there is the average of the whole solution. And so, as we add more heat, the fastest molecules escape, and they leave the slower molecules still in the liquid state. And as those fastest molecules escape, when we recalculate the average, we're going to have a reduction in the average molecular speed or the average temperature because the slower molecules are left behind. That phenomenon. During heat of vaporization, or in relation to the heat of vaporization, is just simply known as the vaporization. And this actually becomes really important. When you sweat, you are using evaporative cooling to maintain body temperature. You want the hottest molecules to go away because those hottest molecules are taking away the heat that they've accumulated. And it's leaving left over a cooler substance, sweat. That now can absorb more heat and then can pull it fast to the molecules. So you always are sort of pulling down the temperature, even when you're heating it up, which helps us to regulate the body temperature across a variety of different organisms.
All right, the next concept here that I want to discuss with water, you've all probably have heard this before. Water is called the universal solvent. The universal solvent, what that really is saying is that water dissolves a lot of stuff. Now, notice that I said lots, and I didn't say all. So water cannot dissolve everything, but it can dissolve a lot of things. And you can actually think of some things that water doesn't dissolve. And anyway. Did you say oil? Yeah, oil is a great example. You form two different layers because the water doesn't incorporate in, into the oil, or the oil doesn't incorporate into the water. Really, the key defining feature that will dictate whether or not water dissolves something is whether or not that material is a polar molecule. In other words, as Dr. Lafreda would say, likes dissolve likes. Since water is polar, it can dissolve other polar molecules. Water can also dissolve ionic molecules. And really, the ionic molecule, even though it doesn't exhibit, pol exhibit polarity, it exhibits the charge that can be attracted. If it's positive, the charge to the negative side, the hydrogen side of the water molecule, or if it's positive to the negative side, uh, oxygen side of the molecule. So polar molecules, because water is polar, and ionic molecules, because we can attract the charge to the polarity of the water. So because we can dissolve things into, well, by the way, before I move on, oil or fat is a non-polar molecule. And since it's a non-polar molecule, we can't actually dissolve that into water without doing some fancy footwork. But because we can dissolve polar molecules and ionic compounds, we can create what are known as solutions. Solutions are going to be liquid mixtures. And those liquid mixtures are going to be homogeneous. So liquid mixtures create homogeneous uh, or well-mixed materials. When water is going to be the material that dissolves the other stuff to make the solution, we call it aqueous. So water in an aqueous solution is the solvent. Okay, I'm giving you a couple terms here. Sol solution and solvent and solute is going to be another term that we give here in just a second. A solvent is going to be the liquid that does the dissolving. So the solvent is the dissolving liquid. The solute is going to be the dissolved material. The, dissol the dissolving material or the solute can be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. So it doesn't just have to be something like sodium. Um, sodium chloride or salt. 
it could be a gas. We could dissolve oxygen into the water, or we could dissolve um, another liquid, something like ethanol, into water. These materials are the solute, the dissolving material. Can be either hydrophilic, which means water loving, which will readily dissolve in water, or the material can be hydrophobic. Which is going to be a water fearing material. And if it's hydrophobic, it's not going to dissolve as well in water. things that uh, become really important when we're dealing with different solutions, which by the way, this eventually is going to lead to where? To the fact that we have solutions inside of the cell and we have solutions surrounding the cell. And we want to be able to quantify those solutions. We want to be able to put some sort of number to those solutions. One of the most common ways that we kind of quantify the solution is centered around the use of a measurement called a mole, not the animal. But related to Avogadro's on the six month throat seems to have the 23rd molecules in a mole. I got a good thing on it. That great. No mind, uh, I'll record it. Awesome. I thought I had more time than that. Awesome. Yeah, it really is, because that's another. On October 23rd, we will celebrate mole hour, or mole minute. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, October 23rd. You'll probably all be asleep. Although we could do it at 6.02 in the, in 6 p.m. <laughs> at 6.02. Come over at 6.01. Y'all leave at 6.03. <laughs> But for that minute, it's going to be wild. <laughs> it's actually still recording. I wonder what that's going to look like. <laughs> it's going to be like, just dark. But it actually records you. It knocks your voice out. It's all and it shows like, you can't see it as much as like, where it's going on. Yeah. It's like, it's like, like a manual. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we're back after this question break. <laughs> so, quantifying aqueous solutions, we're going to center around this idea of the mole. And you can see here that the mole can be represented for. <laughs> Several different phases. It can be represented as the number of particles, or the mass, or the volume of gas, the volume of liquid. And all the mole is is going to be the number of molecules to equate 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. Okay? Six. 6.02. Oh, man, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving time to Bear with me. Sorry. Thank you. 
So 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I've got this number. So to begin to figure out, basically, I, I want you to know how to calculate the mass of a material that would contain those 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Now, hopefully, that number is not just passing you over. Everybody's kind of gets the concept here. You're going to move that decimal 23 positions to the right. And that's the number of molecules that you would need to make one mole. All right? So the first step here, step one, is to calculate a molecular weight. Now, one molecule of something, how, what, anyone remember the unit that we use for one molecule? Molecule. Like, what, what's the unit of measure? Can we use gram for one molecule? Dalton's. Okay, so be thinking about Daltons. And what does the Dalton relate to? <laughs> In other words, what part of the atom has mass? The nucleus, which is made up of, and how many Daltons is a proton? And how many Daltons is a neutron? OK, so how many Daltons are two protons? With the exception of hydrogen, you could look at the periodic table and you could figure out how many Daltons uh, an atom weighs. The reason hydrogen doesn't work is because hydrogen has no neutron. Hydrogen is just proton and electron, right? So the weight of one molecule of hydrogen is just going to be that weight of that one proton, so it's one Dalton for hydrogen. Oxygen, which has eight electrons, or I mean, yeah, well, it has eight electrons, but eight neutrons and eight protons is going to be 16 Daltons. You're probably using them, well, you're, you're probably dealing with molar mass, which is about what we're going to refer to. You're rarely calculating the mass of an individual molecule. <laughs> That's all right, we'll just deal with it, right? Is actually not on. There it goes. Uh, 
<laughs> All right, so step one. We first need to determine the molecular weight in Dalton's, which is going to be the weight of a single molecule. On the substance. Okay, so one mo one molecule. How much does it weigh? And we are going to use terms of Dalton's. So hydrogen. How many Dalton's? One Dalton. Okay. From there, we're going to take and convert our molecular weight that's in Dalton's. We're just going to simply convert that into grams. Now, don't get caught up with this. Literally, what I'm saying is that if we take a material that is one Dalton to convert it into molecular weight, I'm sorry, to convert it into grams to figure out how much one, what's the mass of one mole of that substance, I'll just get rid of the Daltons and now call it grams. So a mole of hydrogen is one gram. So First, calculate the molecular weight in Daltons, and then whatever that molecular weight is, get rid of the Daltons and put in grams, and that's the amount that you would have to weigh out on a scale of that particular material to get your 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Okay? So let's try a problem here, a little bit, a little bit harder problem. Example is going to be the molecule, a molecule of glucose. How many molecules of glucose? Or what's the weight of glucose to get my one mole of glucose? So first we would have to know the molecular formula for that molecule. Anyone have to know what it is? Okay, C6, H12, O6. Now, if you're ever working in a lab, the easiest way to figure out the molar mass, you can calculate it. I'm going to show you how to calculate it in just a second. But the easiest way is to go and get your bottle of stock glucose and look at it and find where it says MW or FW. Because it's going to be labeled with its formula later. It's fine. But you can calculate it too. The only caveat that you have to remember here is for hydrogen. Hydrogen just has a single proton. So we're going to take our c 6 and 12 o 6 carbon. Carbon is going to have a total of six protons. From those six protons, there's also going to be six neutrons. So carbons, the carbon atom's molecular weight is going to be 12 Daltons. For hydrogen, it's going to be one Dalton. And then for oxygen, eight protons, eight neutrons, so 16 Daltons. So that's the weight of each individual. But notice I have six carbons, I have 12 hydrogens, and I have six oxygens. So I'm just simply going to take 12 times 6. Each individual carbon has 12 Daltons, but I have six of those in that molecule. So 12 times 6, which is 72. And then we're going to have 12 hydrogens. So that'll be how many Daltons? 12 Daltons. And then I'm going to have six oxygens, and that's going to give me 96 Daltons. Oops. Ninety-six Daltons. Then just simply take all of those together and add them up. One molecule of glucose, how much does it weigh? I think I heard it. 180. 180 Daltons for one molecule. So this one molecule of glucose, right? Obviously, you use a calculator. Which, by the way, feel free to bring a calculator to any exam, any class period. Calculators are a nice little shortcut. So that's step one. One molecule of glucose is 180 Daltons. How much? 
are we going to need for one mole of glucose? How do I do that? Swap out Dalton's for grams. 180 grams. <laughs> so there are 180 grams of glucose in one mole of glucose. In other words, if I were to come in here with a scale and a bottle of glucose, and I weighed out 180 grams, how many molecules of glucose would I have? <coughs> 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules for one mole. Contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Molecules, whose number is it? Avogadro's. So that's going to be Avogadro's number. So this is the starting point. Now I can take that 180 grams of glucose and I can combine it for a total volume. I can combine it with water for a total volume of one liter. And you would have to remember what that would be called. Take that mole, mix it up with water, so I have a final volume of one liter. So I have one mole per liter. That is a quantity known as molarity. Molarity is moles per liter of a solution. We would call that a molar solution. And it is just simply going to be M. Alright, so here is the process of making up a molar solution. I have no idea what the chemical is, so I'm just going to call it substance green. We weigh out substance green, and we mix with water, substance green, and then we fill it up to our final volume. We mix it and then fill it up to our final volume. So if this was a one liter volumetric flask, I'd start out with just some water. Doesn't matter how much it is, just enough to cover a good portion of the of the volume. Pour in my solute and mix it up either by hand mixing or I can put it on a stir and then final finalize the volume to an exact precise one liter volume. And that would be a one molar solution. One half. What if I doubled the mass of glucose, let's say. So 180 becomes 360. So now I have two Avogadro's numbers, right? Two moles. What if I put that into a liter? What would my polarity be? A two molar solution. Two. I think I'm pretty much out of time, which is kind of a bugger. Yep, I'm out of time. Okay, so we'll pick up here with molarity, quantifying substances um, on Monday. Yes, what I didn't cover I don't think is on the exam. As you're packing up, let me let me check here real quick.